The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Hello, my name's James Wrigley. I'm a financial advisor and one of the principals of Melbourne-based financial planning firm, First Financial. I've been a long-term listener and contributor to the Ensemble Group and podcast, picking up some amazing nuggets of gold over the years. And through this podcast and the people that I'm able to speak to and interview, hopefully I can continue to deliver some of those nuggets of gold to you. You can't buy time, but you can save it. The advisor portal at MLC Life Insurance is just one way we're helping advisors streamline the advice process. Using the advice portal, advisors can generate quick quotes and indicative underwriting decisions in one place. This means less time spent on paperwork and more time focused on clients. To learn more about the MLC Life Insurance Advisor Portal and how it will save you time, visit our website or contact your distribution representative. Hello, welcome back to another episode of the podcast. I've got the pleasure of speaking with Jeff Bonici from Grimsey Wealth today. Uh, Jeff, thank you for joining me here. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, James. We were we were just saying before, before we pressed record, now Grimsey, for anyone that, that doesn't know, if you're in Melbourne, you've probably uh, come across the Grimsey name over the years. Grimsey's been around for a very long time, but uh, I've, I've known of them for a very long time. I've been working on financial advice for a while, but Jeff, I was just saying, I don't know that I've ever had the opportunity to speak to someone from Grimsey, certainly not for half an hour or so, like we might do recording a podcast episode today. So yeah, absolutely. Thanks for, thanks for coming along. No, thank you. Yeah, Grimsey, uh, we've got a long history. Uh, last month, we just celebrated our 40th anniversary. Yeah, right. Um, and you know that's a significant milestone, but our late founder, Phil Grimsey, established the practice 40 years ago, and he had a vision of making a holistic practice that helped medical, dental, and pharmacy professionals at all stages of their career. So it really didn't matter where you were. He wanted to equip the business to be able to help you with whatever milestone and journey and stage of career you were at. Yeah. Um, and he successfully did that. So now 40 years later, uh, we've got about 5,000 odd clients within the practice and the headcount's about 100 across Melbourne, Sydney. Yeah, right. So I wanted to, I think I think maybe the, the, the main theme of of, of our chat today is probably going to be around this idea of specialization. So yep. you know, a lot of a lot of the marketing gurus in financial advice and you know business coaches and so forth will kind of talk about you can't be can't be everything to everyone that you need to be you know, the, the hero to a to a small group of people and, and Grimsey certainly you know built a business around that. Let, let let's let's go back a bit before we get to uh, deep into into the kind of the Grimsey story and what you're up to and who you're working with and so forth, but Let's talk about you, Jeff. And so your, yeah. your, I guess your role at Grimsey. What what is that? And and then how have you ended up where you are? What what's your yeah. what's a bit of your story? Great question. Now I, uh, like many people, entered the financial advice industry by default. So I started uh, through the banking system. I did yeah. my industry based learning, so my degree at Swinburne, and then entered uh, the retail banking network, which was an incredible. Um, experience, uh, then worked in London and was a banker for a long period of time and always had an attraction to financial advice, saw it firsthand working in the premium business at Westpac yeah. um, and really saw how it helped people and changed their life and uh, always had an attraction towards it and then moved into financial advice. Uh, spent three years within the private premium network at Westpac uh, and then as you know, they obviously stepped out of it and the position was made redundant. Um, and then at that opportunity, I stepped into the Grimsey practice. Unfortunately, I was working in BT and there's a bit of a link between the two and I was able to transition across. Um, and now I've been at Grimsey call it circa five years as one of the senior advisors here in the team. So it's a bit of a shame now that the banks aren't providing financial advice in the sense that the opportunity that I was afforded doesn't exist in the market. I was able to jump across and, you know, Unfortunately, our banks don't obviously provide those services anymore. So, you know, if I look back on my career, I probably wouldn't be where I was today if it wasn't for those opportunities that were represented at the time. So, incredibly grateful. Uh, within the four walls here, you are right, we do specialise in medical professionals and there's no shortage of uh, organisations here in this country that do. So, we're mm. part of what's called the ProLoan Network, which is medical advice firms. And here in Melbourne, 
that's your Barrett Baxter Buy, Chip on John O's, DPM, Medique, and then there's firms glo- uh, all across the country, Smith Coffee. But we all uh, are part of the same family. And effectively, what we're trying to do is um, just grow our clients uh, through the different functions of the business and help them with whatever's required for them at stages of career. Yeah, right. So that 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 pro loan network that you that you talk of that that's not a licensee. I, I'm I'm not I've never come across it before. It's yeah. not a licensee. It, no, it's not. It's, it's a self licensed business. Are you? Yeah, correct. We self license. Yeah, okay. yeah, right. Yeah, and I, I think the vast majority of firms within the network probably would. Exactly. Um, but in effect, what the pro loan network is, it's an arrangement with uh, Westpac, a financial institution, where we've got a number of policies from a lending perspective that enable our clients to get into you know, a property with a 5% deposit without lenders, mortgage insurance, we can use future income if they're looking at buying a house. We know they're in a training program, they're about to specialise. And there's all these different uh, solutions that we have for clients that aren't available to the mass market. Yeah, right. So what what was it that made you, obviously Westpac was kind of got it, was getting out of financial advice, so your position okay. was made redundant. But was there something particular that, that attracted you to moving across to, to Grimsey? Yeah, it was. I think when you deal with medical professionals on a daily basis, they're, they're incredibly impressive people. Um, the, you know, they're breathtaking. They're leaders of industry. They spend decades to get to where they are. And the vast majority of them don't do it for the money. Um, they're incredibly time poor. Uh, and what I've found being here for five years is that they're really, um, in their line of work, they generally give advice. Uh, and then when it comes to their turn, when they need a, a advice or recommendations, they're, they're more than willing to listen and uh, be helped along the way. So I think that's where the attraction was. Um, and also, uh, you know, the, the, the similar clients that I was dealing with at Westpac, they were time poor professionals. Um, and, you know, all of our clients are time poor professionals too. Yeah. So, so talk us through, so we want to kind of get into this idea of specialization. As you said, there's there's a number of businesses around the country that that specialise in medical professionals in in one way, shape, or form, whether they're accounting businesses, financial planning businesses, or or so forth. How is that? How is that? Like, what I'm trying to say is, how's that kind of worked from like a marketing client acquisition perspective? What have you had to do, or haven't had to do, because Grimsey is known so well in that medi- medical professional field? Yeah, it's an interesting one. So we've got a few approaches to how we acquire clients. And the primary one that we've utilised over the 40-year history is speaking at the university events when graduates graduate from medical school. So your Melbourne, your Monash and your Deakins, and we present um, your top tips and traps in your first year. So we go through salary packaging, budgeting. A lot of clients, when they come out of university, tax, budgeting, income is completely foreign to them. And the medical professionals within this country, it's the only profession where you graduate from a university and you're guaranteed a job. It also with pay increases through their training, um, through their uh, placement. So yep. they're in an incredibly u- unique position. But what we do is take an incredibly educational approach. And what we find is if we can help a client when they're an intern, then we generally have them through the journey. And the practice takes comfort in being here for 40 years and helping many different specialties and disciplines that. Whatever trajectory an intern goes through today, we've got a high degree of confidence that someone's walked in those footsteps steps before, whether it's doing fellowships, uh, PhDs, specialising, buying practices, et cetera. We'd like to think that we've got, we're well equipped to handle whatever, whatever journey they go on. So um, in answering that question, we're very active in the university space. Um, and that's been the lifeblood of the practice. And then secondary to that is obviously word of mouth, all about medical, dental, and pharmacy professionals swimming in the same circles. And what we've found, if we can look after their needs, help them manage the complexities of retirement, tax, money, time poor, um, and the, the practice is built in a manner that supports them. So I work within the wealth team. So in the wealth team, We've got, call it, five financial advisors here in Melbourne, and then we've recently split out the insurance team, um, and that's got two advisors within it. But then the accounting team, where the crux of the clients sit, uh, you know, that's a large headcount. Then we've also got a self-managed super t- team within the business, and then we've got a broking team. So um, we like to think whatever need a client has, we can satisfy it within these four walls. Um, and whatever stage of life, they have different requirements, but- uh, as they evolve through their career, obviously uh, their, their needs change. Yeah, as so you've you mentioned before, 
it gets about a hundred people across yeah. all of those different all of those different service lines. So there's not there's not that many businesses that that manage to build up to that that kind of level. So there's kind of clear evidence in whatever you're doing is working. If you if you're able to if the business has been able to build over forty years to a headcount of that of that many and you know five thousand odd clients, it's uh it's working. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think everyone's passionate about what they do, and um, you know we're very active in uh, sponsoring the industry events, seminars, speaking, and so forth. And, and that's uh, bared a lot of clients over the journey. Um, but yeah, it's definitely the universities. And look, it's a competitive market. Every time we go there, all of our competitors there, everyone's promoting our tax packages. But what we find, if we can get a client in the practice early in our ecosystem and they're, they're listening to advice, we're explaining salary packaging, we're explaining the importance of personal insurance, then it opens their ears to receiving advice when they progress through their career. Um, what we generally find is we come across clients that are quite self-directed later on. It's it's definitely a more challenging equation to try to influence them in a positive light through yeah. their career. Yeah. Can you maybe maybe talk us through, I don't know, is there a few different Life, major life stages that these medical professionals are going through. So, like, what what does an initial engagement with with someone that's just coming out of university? So, you've been to the university, presented, and someone's like, "Hey, I like I like the look of Jeff. I like what he was, what he's saying." What what does an initial what does your initial financial planning engagement look like for them in those earlier years? And then yeah. maybe we'll kind of tackle some of the other bigger milestones as they move on. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. So, initially, from a financial planning perspective, we would accompany that with the tax solution, and that would be around your salary packaging, explaining your meals and entertainment, your deductions, and so forth. So, the tax is definitely the in initially. But yes. then, as a, someone progresses through their career, where I'll come into the picture is helping them with cash flow, budgeting, saving, personal insurance, and and structuring their investments for potentially their first home. Um, and facilitating that. So that's probably what's common with, you know, your first, your interns, five to six years. As clients progress through their careers, they generally, uh, they all have huge tax problems um, and we try to manage the complexities associated with that. And then as they progress through their career, so they're specialists or they're, they're, they're consultants, we can help them with different solutions, what's relevant to them, whether it's buying practices, recycling debt, um, and the like. Gotcha. It, it, so that the the I was going to say next the buying of the practices bit. So that kind of that that specialisation. If you mentioned before, it's a little bit more difficult for someone that's already doing. It's already a bit self directed. If if they're coming to you later on, that that's a far more challenging client to deal with. Yeah. Yep. I, I, how do you how do you turn them around? Like, is there if if they've already bought their business. Well, they're about to buy the business. How do you, um, how do you, how do you kind of swing them around to? Yeah, no, to your I know world? what you're saying. I think look, it, ultimately, it would. It's a great question because people come to us uh, all the time, and they've got businesses they're selling, they've got tax issues, business partners, and it's about. I think how it works effectively within this practice, it's a seamless relationship between the tax advice and the financial planning advice. Yeah. So it's two heads, it's two schools of thoughts looking at their position and advising. And generally, with an accountant, I find their retrospectives, they look in the revision mirror, so they look at your tax, your deductions. And then as an advisor, we try to map out the future. So the the, the transactions that obviously warrant advice are quite, are quite pivotal in people's, uh, in their lives. So whether it's buying practices, marriage breakdowns, disputes between partners, stepping into private practice from public practice and what that actually means for them. It's about having conversations that are holistic at those different points of time. Yep. But what, what, what I'm finding more and more that uh, when I'm talking to medical professionals, um, in the past, they just wanted to keep on going forever. They never wanted to stop. They loved what they're doing. But you know, the, the public hospital system, um, you know, the, a lot of clients are incredibly burnt out. They've got huge hours. And now it's a conversation of, hey, when can I potentially stop? Have I built the resources up to enable me to do so? Uh, and am I on track? So that's more of a conversation that I'm having more frequent with clients about where they're going to end up because – um, you know, the days of working to your 60s, the late 70s and consulting are probably a thing in the past with the younger doctors I speak to now. Yeah, yeah. I would I would imagine so. And and I guess being 40 years, are there clients that have been there the whole time? Like for like if, you, if they've got in, a, in an intern 
in their late twenties or so through to retired yeah. in their late sixties. You're like at forty years, there's you're probably getting to a point where there'd be some might have been people that have been there the whole time. Absolutely, yeah. So we recently celebrated our fortieth birthday. Uh, I think that was about a hundred clients. Uh, all of them had been here over thirty years. Uh, yeah. So as you can imagine, they're, they're definitely not young. But um, yeah. it was crazy. One of our clients got up, an ophthalmologist. He's seventy five, and he spoke about income tax rates when he started at sixty six percent. He doesn't know what we're all complaining about at forty seven. So. Um, yeah, we've definitely got a huge amount of clients that have been here for a very long time and, you know, we've done right by them and they've prospered um, and I think that's fundamentally why we're here. You mentioned before about like the, you, you kind of, the, the, the bank's not providing the financial advice a- anymore and maybe there's a, there's a bit missing, I don't know if it's missing is maybe not the right phrase, but like it, you spoke really fondly of the, of the, the learnings and the mentoring and things that you might have got through the banks, the kind of opportunities to develop as a financial advisor. How do you think, do you have any opinions on how as an industry we we deal with that that gaping hole that there isn't this you know, four, four big banks with a big army of financial advisors and good, bad or otherwise, yeah. there's a lot of good people have come out of the banks and gone on to do other things that, that otherwise without without that, they wouldn't be here. What do you, where do you think the, the future lies? Uh, see, it's interesting. I was recently invited by Macquarie to hear the Federal Minister, Steve Jones, speak about where he's taken the industry and his thoughts. But I sat there and I, I don't like – You've all, everyone's got their opinion on what happened with the banks and what they did or didn't mm. do. But I think um, you know, a lot of practices in the industry today just don't have the balance sheet to bring through the amount of advisors that the banks did. Um, the bank was an incredible environment to learn um, from experienced people, masters of industry. We're in the fortunate position here where we've got, I'd say, three associate advisors coming through the the, the future, uh, the, the, the system, yeah. and they'll, they'll uh, become incredible advisors when the time's right. But it, it, it's it's a shame because I just I know I've, I've listened to your podcast frequently and I, I just uh, I speak I know you just interview a lot of smaller practices and they just can't afford to put people on, but uh, yeah I, I don't know how you plug the hole to be honest it's probably mm-hmm. if anyone's worked in the bank for a long period of time you do know things go in circles so they probably will get back into it in some period of time because how will they grow the revenue if they're not doing it but um yeah you know, I, I I don't know the answer to that question to be honest. Yeah, and like it's you know it's someone I, I saw something a while back. This came back a couple of years ago. And the, you know the if you if you look at the accounting profession, you, you've got the you know those big accounting firms that that um what are they what do they do? What does the accountants do? The CPA, they're putting you know pulling all of these people through the CPA. And I saw some stat. It was something like half of the people that finish the CPA working for PwC or wherever they work for within a year or two of them finishing the CPA, they've They've gone and they've moved on to something else. Whether they've gone into a smaller business, whether they've gone to work in the ind- in, in industry as well, they're 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 fueling that. And by and large, the banks have fueled the financial advice industry. We're fortunate enough that we're not quite the same size as what, what Grimsey is, but big enough that we can afford to take on associate advisors and support them through their professional year. Whereas a lot of a lot of businesses that are in the uh, ensemble network, and as you mentioned, a lot that I've that I've done podcast interviews with may be not in a position to be able to do so, but it sounds like you guys are. So, so that's, yeah, uh, and I think you know, that's, that's evident with the whole in the industry. There's a lot of people dropping off and the amount of people coming in sort of don't, don't um, you know, it doesn't balance itself out. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned before about you spent a couple of years overseas. What uh, what what took you overseas and, and what were you doing over there? Yeah, so I was working for Westpac at the time um, and I was in the migrant banking team. So I went over in 2009 just at the end of the GFC. So it, it was a refreshing experience because anyone that was over there at that period of time know it knows everyone in the UK was trying to get out. So at the time, Westpac had a migrant banking centre there and we were proactively trying to obtain UK migrants before they came across. Yep. So we would help them with their banking, set up their affairs, help them with currency transfers. And when they got to Australia, it was a seamless integration. Um, but we would promote the business across uh, all of Europe. So whether it was um, Ireland, Scotland and uh, do uh, seminars uh, and so forth to get them across. But in short... We were placing thousands of migrants each month across from the UK to Australia and that was a pretty eye-opening experience because during the GFC in the UK, um, it was a horrible place. Unemployment was surging. Uh, 
property values had deteriorated and a lot of people were in dire, dire need. So um, I know in this country we've been quite uh, immune. Property prices have generally always gone in an upward manner and people have been employed. So uh, that was a very eye-opening experience very early on in my career. It's a pretty unique perspective, I guess, that you bring with you then through your financial planning journey. Because as you said, we I, I never lived or worked o- worked overseas before, so we had a, kind of had a bit of a, a fairly sheltered um, you know, view of what was going on. We didn't live through some of the some of the tougher times that happened overseas. So, you, so you were there helping people effectively leave the the UK to come to Australia. Absolutely, and there's no <laughs> shortage of them here. So. <laughs> But yeah, it was, it was an incredible time. And then I came back and uh, helped the UK migrants with their affairs onshore. So buying first homes, UK pension transfers, personal insurance. And then the nexus between advice was very strong. And I jumped into it because um, in effect, you know, I was having there were currency transfers, purchasing homes, and there was, a, there was an immediate link between the two and moved into advice. Mm. Have you have you done any more in that sense? Because like, no, it's been someone that, a couple of podcast episodes ago that's come out from South Africa and he was talking about this idea of, of building up um, you know, a, a, a business around this idea of helping people migrating to Australia. Have you have you ever given that any thought? No, no. That? Well, to be honest with you, I haven't really given thought to much because when I came out of the bank, it was very evident that I was uh, under-equipped from an education perspective. So I spent my time doing my master's and my CFP through DKIT. So yeah. Um, that that absolutely has absorbed a lot of my creative thinking because I've spent the last four years working and studying part time. But um, yeah, there's definitely a need for that because when people move cross country, there's there's a lot of uncertainty and a lot of unknowns around what they do. How you, how did you find this this the studying? Given clearly you've got a lot of experience before you even opening the textbook to to do that studying. How did you find the the studying together together with all of the work experience you've got up until now? Yeah, and I felt it was challenging. There's absolutely no doubt about it. So originally, when I uh, stepped out of Westpac, it was evident that I was very under-equipped from an education perspective. My first degree was in marketing, and it was non-related. So I had to move fairly quickly to um, strengthen that side of my resume, and I started my graduate diploma at Kaplan. I did that, and I found it okay, but I wasn't. It wasn't really. I wasn't really obtaining a huge amount of knowledge, and. Um, then I moved to Deakin to finish the master's and look, it was probably triple the work and triple the cost, but I, I found it a lot more, um, it probably suited my style of learning a lot more. I found the lecturers were very uh, generous with their time and their knowledge and I actually found it very valuable. It was an absolute, a huge cost. Um, so once I did that, then uh, part of their program is the final subject of the CFP. So fortunately, I was able to complete both and get both qualifications in such a short period of time. But it's incredibly hard to juggle work and study. Uh, The prior experiences from work were beneficial in the sense um, I sort of knew what I was in for. But trying to manage a full-time job while studying part-time is always challenging. Um, You've just really got to be aware of what's coming up in your diary and so forth. Yeah. So that masters the masters program that you did did you have to was that just an extra four subjects on top of what you'd done from Kaplan or you had to start again like did you get no, some it was an issue yeah. from Kaplan Good question I, I got some credit so I think from memory I did I had to do five more subjects yeah okay and then, yeah. and and how was the course delivered was it all was it online lectures or did you have to go to Deakin? it. Uh, a variety. So I did it through yeah. COVID. So a lot of it was virtual. Online, yeah. Fair yeah. Right. Um, and that, that, look, COVID provided me with an incredible opportunity to tick these boxes because there wasn't a huge amount of other things to do. <laughs> my, uh, my associate advisor had to do a um, a, a degree in a similar. He didn't have any any related degrees. Done it through Uni SA, and for the the bulk of it was done during COVID. It's like, well, you know, fortunately, I had nothing else to do. I was told I wasn't allowed to go and do anything else. So. Yeah, I know. So it's made, a sort of a distant memory now. Try, yeah, yeah, it's definitely trying not to think about it, but yeah, it seems like uh, it was definitely a long time ago. It's CFP5. So that last subject, CFP, CFP5, yep. it, was that a subject of the Deacon course? And so it kind of crossed over? No, it was a separate subject. So yeah, they give you credits for, I think it's the first four, and then the final uh, assignment and exam you need to pass. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And if I, I know that you've got your CFP, you can remember that final exam. It was a doozy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So it was, yeah, I I did exactly the same. Well, not exactly the same. So I did the Kaplan 
I had a relevant university degree, but I did the Kaplan. It was called the Graduate Diploma of Applied Finance back then, but it was the financial planning thing. And that gave me exemptions from CFP 2, 3, and 4. So I had to do the first one. I think ethic, the subject one was probably ethics, something like that. And then you yeah, had to do the CFP 5, which was write the SOA and then sit an exam. It was a, it was a long exam. Yeah. No, no. It was it was crazy, especially doing that SOA from scratch. I think it was about 80 pages mine came to. Yeah, yeah. I I failed the SOA the first time. The um I submitted it and they I, I got to a point where I was just sick of it. Like, okay, I'm just I'm just submitting this. I was starting to run out of time, but I just submitted it and that wasn't good enough. I had to resubmit. Yep. So what's so what's next for you? What what's on what's the what's the career path for you? Where are you headed? What it, what's next? Yeah, I think the major change within the practice here is we've 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 consulted a firm called Peloton, and they've come in and they've basically lifted the cord and uh, they've, they're they're really redefining what we do for clients, how we charge, how we position what we do, because I think in a multidiscipline practice something will be neglected, and I think it's been evident that um, we need to focus on holistic financial advice for our clients um, and build that aspect of the business. So. As of recent, my role was sort of split between personal insurance and financial advice, and now we've segregated a team to personally run the personal insurance team, so we're no longer doing that. Yep. Um, so I think that the challenge in the medium term for the business is really to build our financial planning business, ongoing advice, help clients navigate complexities, um, and Peloton are here to definitely assist and help us through that. I think they're going to be here for the next couple of years piloting that change um, and making us clear on what is a client, how do we charge and what are the services we provide because, yep. um, you know, we've had a mindset that as long as they're in the ecosystem, that's fine. But now that we're really looking at this function of the business as a standalone and how we can really grow it. Yeah. So I think that's uh, definitely front of mind. But, you know, there's a huge thing, the amount of things on the technology stack that we've introduced. But the, the 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 main thing that I would say that's really changed over the last six months we've impl- we've partnered with a firm called Drum and Capital, okay. um, and they're a managed account provider, uh, and they provide uh, their managed account solutions to our clients, um, and that's beneficial from the perspective it sort of cuts out the noise with constructing your own portfolios, managing risk profiles, meeting with fund managers. Um, they do all that for us. Uh, they've got scale. Um, they believe the market is inefficient and they've made tactical decisions in line of market conditions. So it would be virtually impossible us, for us to replicate what they do. So that's provided a huge efficiency to- uh, efficiencies within our business because we've got a lot more time back in our diaries. But I think, you know, what was it? The short to medium term with the practice is obviously building our advice um, um, and focusing on that and then, just yeah, just, uh, from my perspective, it's really just building up my ongoing clients and mm. growing. Yeah. How did you manage? So the we're going through the whole managed account thing here as well. How how did you prior prior to managed accounts? How did you um, manage client portfolios? Yeah, great question. So what we used to use was digital advice. It's a Macquarie portfolio tool through their platform. Um, They're right. And they uh, effectively they would create the ROA and restructure the portfolio in line with whatever the risk profile was. And we thought that we used that predominantly for exchange traded funds. So we were very um, had a house view on passive management, and that was an incredible solution. But what we found is it wasn't really engaging. There was no commentary. There was no communication. Um, and what we found with Drummond is. That level of communication they provide to clients around their, their investment committees, their market outlooks, um, their portfolio rebalancing, it really does arm the advisors with the knowledge and know-how to talk to clients about changes within their portfolio. Yep. Um, and that's important because what we've found, and we've only done this in the last six months, our clients have a lot more confidence in the people managing their money and decisions are made in real time. So you and I both know that uh, markets don't work in annual reviews, uh, investment cycles. So Having people making decisions in real time around clients' portfolios and money, it, it's incredibly beneficial because clients are seeing the benefits of those changes being made in real time. Um, and ultimately, we're here to drive the best possible investment outcomes for clients. And yeah, you know, I think what Drummond do, it's incredibly hard to replicate. They've got scale. They've got some of the best minds in the market. And the technology around managed accounts, it's vastly superior to a bespoke tailored portfolio we've found. Yeah, right. And and what's your and it's only early days, but what's the client feedback been like on on the on the transition and 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 the new world for them? 
Yeah, it's it's been very, very positive. Obviously, it's a case-by-case situation because we've got a lot of clients with capital gains. Um, a lot of clients, um, the, the great thing about Drummond is they use a variety of passive and active management and the clients have the, clients have the visibility over the portfolios too. So um, po- all feedback has been incredibly positive to this point in time. Um, and then when once you sort of plug them into Drummond's ecosystem around their newsletters, their investment communities, their outlooks, it gives clients a lot more confidence around the people that are involved with their money. Um, and it shows that we're acting in their best interest because we've gone to market and found this solution. So that's been something that's been very well received with the clients that we've yeah. um, managed at the moment. And also what they do that's not hugely relevant is they give us opportunities around deal flow. So if there's anything of relevance, private equity, we can present those solutions to clients. And that's good because um, you know we couldn't really compete with your Crest Owns, your Scalas, your JB Weirs previously, but now we've got the ability to provide these solutions to clients if relevant. So um, you know, it's it's all been very positive. Yeah. And and so you following on from that, do you you treat a segment of your client base as kind of wholesale sophisticated in, investors? How do you, how do you operate? In that, pers- in yeah, that space. Yeah, so that's, that's actually a good question too. So traditionally, we've just done everyone under the retail umbrella um, yeah. for no real reason. Um, I would say the vast majority of our clients are wholesale. If you just look at how that test is satisfied, the 250 or the 2.5, it's easily yeah. done by all of them. Um, we've always just taken the approach to retail advice because although they might tick those criteria, they probably aren't that savvy around investments and markets and so forth and the factors that influence them. Um, but we are in the process of now of treating a lot of these high net worth clients as wholesale clients. Um, but yeah, I would say the majority of our clients within the practice are under the retail umbrella. Yeah, we're, uh, we're much the same as much as there's certainly there's clients that we work with that meet the, that meet the particular definitions. By I think we might only have a handful. You probably count them all on one hand to the number of clients that we have that we actually treat as wholesale or sophisticated and then just treat everyone else as retail because um yeah well, it's challenging yeah because yeah. if you're providing contribution advice around super funds which i'd say overwhelm the majority of all of our clients me that's retail advice you've so, got to do it anyway don't you yeah so it, the, the, that's where it's a little bit gray but when it comes to um getting that up and running it's definitely a priority yep and you and just kind of last thing you you, you mentioned just briefly there your, your, your tech stack i'm always interested to here, like what what bits and pieces you're using in the business and and how it's going for you. What like what are you, yeah? What are look, you using? It's crazy. When I did the list, because I know that you talk to a lot of clients about what you're using and what's in the yeah. universe. I actually saw there's about 15 different programs we use, which in itself probably answers a few questions. But um, list them off. What have you got? Yeah, we've got my prosperity uh, as a client facing CRM. So it gives it's an incredibly powerful tool for a client to understand their balance sheet. It surprises us to this day how little people actually understand where their money is. And especially if someone takes a controlling um, reins in the relationship, the, the other party has no idea. So that's good for that. We use Fold Invite for document um, sending out to clients in a secure manner. Uh, Padua is something we've recently started using, which is a power planning tech company. Oh, yeah, um, right. We used to have an in-house power planner, but we've started using Padua and they're, you know, they've been incredible so forth. Uh, we use X-Plan internally for projections, uh, risk researcher, wealth solver, suite files for document storage, uh, Adobe Sign for sending documents to clients. Salesforce at a practice level. So Salesforce is the glue that ultimately brings the practice together. So between your lending, um, your insurance, your wealth, uh, and your accounting team, we can see the whole of share of your client and we can forecast pipelines and revenues, which is very important. Yep. Use class for self-managed super funds, zero on the tax front, uh, fee synergy for invoices, nitro for amending PDFs, Calendly for... Um, Booking meetings. Diary, yeah. yeah and yeah, then yeah. Uh, we're in the process of looking at Finometrica for risk profiling because, uh, you know, I did, with risk profiling, you can't never ask enough. You, it's always better to ask more questions than later. Yeah. Little nice. So, yeah, it's a bit of a tongue <laughs> quite, twister. Quite a, quite a list there. I know, look, I, I'm, I know of some of those, but uh, for anyone that's listening, maybe re listen to that section and. Uh, Write down all the names and do a bit of research. It's always interesting to see what business, what what kind of tech businesses are using and and, and what they aren't. Jeff, thanks yeah. for thanks for your time this afternoon. 
If anyone wants to chat with you more, where can they find you? Uh, where, where, where's best to reach out to you? Yeah, probably just on LinkedIn. Happy to talk to anyone who's, um, you know, thinking about what to do from a study perspective or the medical space or uh, just a general chat about the industry in, in uh, you know, at all. So thanks for your time. Yeah, nice. Thanks, Jeff. We'll put some links to your, to your profile in the show notes wherever you might be listening to this. Champion, thanks, James. Thanks for joining me. Bye. See ya.